shipped off where no one would hear from him again. They said that Monsanto offered them a bribe of one to two million dollars if they approved the RBGH without further research. Monsanto responded on national Canadian TV that they had misunderstood an offer for research money. Documents were stolen out of a locked file cabinet. And they eventually got permission to approve, actually to review, the FDA's evaluation of RBGH and wrote a volume this thick on how it was full of gaps and improper assumptions and omissions, which I analyzed in my chapter three called Spilled Milk. And I describe some of the research that the FDA used to defend approval. For example, I think you'll find this one entertaining, this bit of, bit of quote science. The FDA scientists wrote an article in Science Magazine and said that the amount of, of natural bovine growth hormone in milk does not increase substantially in cows treated with RBGH, but even if it did increase, it wouldn't matter because 90% is destroyed during pasteurization. I looked into this with the help of some other investigators, and it turns out there actually was, according to the citations that they were using, a 26% increase in this growth hormone. A 26% increase in a hormone. But apparently that wasn't significant because the researchers only injected three cows. And I read in the study, they injected the cows with 10.6 milligrams per day, parentheses, the daily, the approximate dose. Now, by the time I read this, I'd been doing a lot of investigation, and when it said approximate dose, my red flags went up, and I called a friend of mine, who I knew would give me the straight scoop, because he had published in his dairy newsletter the, some stolen documents from the FDA years earlier. And he had showed, he had showed that um, when Monsanto wanted to verify that injections did not interfere with fertility, the researchers apparently added cows to the study that were pregnant before injection. When cows got sick, they were removed from studies altogether. It also showed that immediately following injection, there was an increase in hormone levels in the blood of up to a thousand fold. So I said to my friend Pete Harden, Pete, it says 10.6 milligrams per day, the average dose, the approximate dose. He immediately said, no one injects every day. It would be economically infeasible. Dairy farmers inject every two weeks. I said, how much do they inject? He said, 500 milligrams, not 10.6. The researchers actually used a different company's RBGH, one that was never approved, slightly different formulation, but used a daily dose instead of that big two biweekly dose. And we know from the stolen documents that on the biweekly dose, hormone levels skyrocket by as much as a thousand fold. So perhaps they chose a daily dose to avoid that spike in hormone levels in the milk. But it doesn't matter, right? Because 90% is destroyed during pasteurization. Well, the same undergraduate did that research also. And they heated milk for 30 minutes at 162 degrees. Normally at that temperature, you heat milk for 15 seconds and call it pasteurized. So they heated milk 120 times longer. Imagine heating a turkey 120 times longer than the instructions. But they only destroyed 19%. They only destroyed 19%. They added powdered hormone, 146 times the natural occurring level of hormone, heated it 120 times longer, and were then able to destroy 90%. And that's what the FDA quoted. That was what the FDA used as a basis for safety. Now, we don't know if this particular hormone is bad for human beings. We may not even have receptors for it. But that's not the only thing that increases in milk. Antibiotics increase in milk. Pus increases in milk. That's treated from RBGH. But also, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. Two very sophisticated journals published this information in 1998. Premenopausal women with high levels of IGF-1 are seven times more likely to develop breast cancer. Outside of family history, it's the number one risk factor. Men are four times more likely to develop prostate cancer. IGF-1 is also implicated in colon and lung cancer. IGF-1 in milk is identical chemically to the IGF-1 in human beings, and milk drinkers tend to have higher levels of IGF-1. And the milk from cows treated with RBGH has higher levels 
of IGF-1. <coughs> Sobering news, isn't it? So that's the second category. Milk, dairy products from cows treated with genetically modified bovine growth hormone. So let's talk about the first category, the one that most people know about, the crops. And let's talk about the FDA once again. Because in, the F in 1992, the FDA formulated a policy on genetically modified crops. They said no testing was necessary if the industry that created the foods believed it were safe, then they could bring it on the market without even telling the FDA. <coughs> no long-term safety testing required, no notification required, and they justified this policy with the following sentence. We know of no information showing that the foods created from these new methods differ in any meaningful or uniform way. We know of no information. Remember that. I'm going to test you on it. We know of no information. And that's what Americans believed. They figured that the, the FDA scientists got together, looked around, couldn't find any information. That must be the same. Years later, a friend of mine spearheaded a lawsuit against the FDA. He got 44,000 documents, internal, formerly secret documents, and it showed what was really going on. The scientists said, these foods can create, remember that list, allergies, toxins, carcinogens or new diseases, antibiotic resistant diseases, that's a new one, nutritional problems. They also said these problems would not necessarily be obvious to those who create the foods, and therefore they must be subjected to long-term safety testing before being fed to the public. One person summarizing all the comments from the scientists in the agency said, the technical experts at the agency believe that these foods are different than foods created from normal con conventional means, and they have different risks. You remember what the comment was in the policy? We know of no difference. You know who was in charge of that policy? Michael Taylor, former attorney to Monsanto. He was in charge overseeing the rewriting of this policy. One comment from a scientist at the FDA made public from the lawsuit was, what's happened to this document? It's become a very pro political document, very pro-industry. It doesn't address consumer concerns. And he said, this is the industry's pet idea, namely that there's no unintended side effects, but the data doesn't support this. So they were aware that there could be unintended side effects. When the experts in, Canadian, in the Canadian Royal Society looked at it, they said the, defa the default prediction of genetic modification is unintended side effects, and that there's no justification to assume that they're safe. David Suzuki says, if a politician or a scientist tells you that GM foods are safe, he's either very stupid or lying. David Suzuki is a geneticist. You may have seen him on PBS. So this was the concern by the scientists, but the number two person at the FDA, Michael Taylor, and even the number one person, the commissioner. The commissioner wrote a letter, which became public from the lawsuit, which said, the biotechnology policy is now in tune with the intentions of the general biotechnology policy of the White House, which is to also ensure the safe and speedy development of the US biotechnology industry. <coughs> there was a huge movement to popularize genetic engineering because America was the breadbasket of the world and America was the provider of technology for the world, let's put them together. This was also industry's goal. When Arthur Anderson, a consultant for Monsanto, described how they had consulted with Monsanto, they said, describe your ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And the, the um, Monsanto executive said, we see a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds are genetically modified and patented. And then the Arthur Anderson consultant announced that they worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. And key to their success was the influence that Monsanto had in the government, which was legendary. One commenter who was in charge of biotechnology issues for about 20 years said that, that the regulatory agencies in the government have done everything that big agribusiness has asked them to do and told them to do. So that's the situation we face. 
they recommended long-term safety testing. 